Okay, we are recording. Okay, so uh, wait, wait a second. Uh, yes, <laughs> I confirm the recording started. Go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much indeed uh, and for welcome uh, to everybody and thank you for being with us today. My name uh, is Jacinta Jean and I'm one of the organizers of this seminar together with uh, Yasmin Macaron and Patrick Michel. Uh, briefly who we are, uh, I'm uh, an architect uh, specialized in the conservation of the built heritage. I graduated from the Polytechnic of Milan and gained a PhD at l'Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and the Polytechnic of Turin. Since uh, 2005, uh, I'm the responsible for the bachelor and master degree in conservation restoration at SUPSI. SUPSI is uh, the University of Applied Art and Sciences of Southern Switzerland. And I coordinate teaching activities, uh, restoration sites, uh, and uh, interdisciplinary research projects. Uh, uh, my publication and interest focus on long-term conservation and maintenance program, technical art history, and 20th century architecture. I'm uh, part of several institutions active in the conservation of cultural heritage, like uh, Ecomo Suisse, uh, Docomomo, and many others. So, Jasmine Macaron, Thank you, thank you, Jacinta, for leaving me the floor. Okay, so I'm uh, Yasmin Macaroon. I'm an architect uh, and archaeologist. I'm graduated from the Lebanese University in Beirut, and I have made a PhD in archaeology and a postgraduate uh, diploma in, in archaeological site conservation. Since uh, almost 20 years, I've uh, been involved and I have directed the Center of uh, Conservation and Restoration at the Lebanese University that uh, prepare all the new generation in, in heritage conservation, mainly architectural conservation and archaeological conservation. I have my own practice as a restorer at the same time, and I'm involved in many heritage association and in particular, I'm actually uh, president of e-commerce Lebanon. I welcome you in this seminar and I leave the floor for Patrick. Hello to everyone. So I'm Patrick Michel. I'm a senior lecturer and researcher at the University of uh, Lausanne. Uh, but I'm here today to speak about another institution I'm part of. Uh, it's uh, Restart. So Restart Beirut is co-organizer of this seminar as well. It's a fund depending on the of the King Baudouin Foundation in Belgium. It was created in October 2020, uh, so after the blast, to respond to the increasing needs of restoration and preservation of artifacts in Beirut. Our goal today is to value the traditional know-how and um, uh, to develop a sustainable transfer of knowledge uh, with academia partnerships with public and private uh, money. And this is why and how we uh, created this uh, uh, workshop and the collaboration with uh, SUPSI and the uh, Université uh, Libanese. Uh, I have a PhD in uh, archaeology and uh, Near Eastern philology, and also a degree in uh, cultural heritage law. Thank you. And next uh, to us, uh, there is Tiziana Botticelli, who will help uh, with the technical needs, microphone switching and questions. Uh, the seminar will be mainly in English, uh, but some talks uh, will be in French. Uh, and this uh, reflects uh, the talking reality in Lebanon and in Beirut. Questions can be asked either in English or in French. At the end of each talk, if they are specific related to the talk, otherwise we would like to have general questions and a larger debate at the end of the seminar, so at the end of the afternoon. You can uh, use the chat to make your comments or questions, or you can raise your hand uh, and then open your microphone. Uh, 
Um, the seminar is organizing in two parts. I will moderate the first part, part and Patrick uh, the second one. Between the two parts, uh, there is a small coffee break. The seminar will be recorded and made available both on the SUPSI website and on the Restart Beirut website. Well, before starting the talks, uh, uh, the usual recommendation as usual, um, mute your microphone if you haven't done it already. So the topic we are dealing with today, unfortunately, is very current. Uh, earthquakes, wars and devastation do not stop hitting the planet, causing enormous damage and losses to the population and to the environment. Also, the literature on the subject is large because uh, this issue touches many areas around the world. The need to organize this seminar comes uh, from our work in Beirut. Two years ago, the Restart Beirut Foundation and the Swiss Embassy asked uh, the SUPSI degree program in conservation restoration to participate uh, in the recovery of the interior decoration of the Susok Palace, uh, which were heavily damaged uh, during the blast of August the 4th uh, in 2020. The Susok Palace, uh, completed in 1860, is undoubtedly the most important uh, private palace in Beirut, inhabited by the same family over the years. Both uh, the palace and uh, the large surrounding garden have an important uh, historical, artistic and social value, recalling the rich uh, cosmopolitan atmosphere of Beirut uh, in the late 19th century. And in this context, uh, the interior plaster decorations play a crucial role. The blast severely damaged the palace, but not all the elements are lost. Our first mission to Beirut aimed at assessing the state of conservation of uh, the plaster decoration, providing data for defining the priorities of intervention and planning future steps in collaboration with the owners and with the funding institutions. As you can see, at our arrival, the first emergency intervention and removing of the debris were already done. Our inspections were conducted to understand what remained. So we did a technical examination and a condition assessment identify all the emergency treatments uh, necessary on the short term uh, to protect uh, and stabilize the decoration and avoid further damages and losses, especially before structural repair of the building that are now underway, and to identify mid and long term actions uh, for developing recovery programs for the repair, reconstruction and preservation of these decorations. Here in the picture, you can see a visual summary of our inspection. A second SUPSI mission was possible thanks uh, to the research funds obtained uh, by the Swiss State the Secretary for Education, Research and Innovation, uh, thanks to the ASHO SSO with the leading house uh, Middle East and North Africa, with additional financial support uh, from the Restart Beirut Foundation and the Swiss Embassy. This uh, second mission allowed us uh, to reinforce uh, the network and the collaboration with our Lebanese partners, involving also a young generation of professionals in conservation. Aim of the second mission 
was uh, the planning and developing of methods and techniques for stabilization and emergency treatments and open discussion with the public and with the different uh, stakeholders. The main goal of the project is, of course, uh, the maximum retention of what is still existing of all the historical materials and their values. But during our second mission, many questions arose on how to identify and assess the options for recovery and reconstructions. The evaluation of different options could be based on the appraisal of the extension of damage, but also on the intention, and this is a critical decision, whether or not to include uh, the traumatic event uh, in the history of the building. In many areas, uh, uh, reconstruction à l'identique uh, is technically possible. In most of the rooms, uh, the decorative scheme uh, is composed uh, by casted elements that could be copied and applied. There is a rich photographic documentation before the blast. And uh, the spirit of the place is still existing in the memory of the family who was living there until a few years ago. So in principles, it could be possible involving good craftsmen to reconstruct reproducing the decoration exactly where it was as it was, according to the famous motto used uh, by the first time by the Major of Venice uh, after the collapse uh, of the San Marco Bell Tower in 1902, with all the contradiction of a similar approach. But under a critical point of view, as conservators, it is difficult to consider if a formal reconstruction à l'identique could help maintain the character of the building, or instead does not impoverish it by turning it into a nice papier mâché decoration that looks back to a bygone age. As conservators, uh, we have ethical principles, and one of them is inviting to make new additions recognizable in order to respect the historical matter and avoid forgery. So we are confronted with many ethical and contradictory questions. Is it culturally possible to come back to what we had before? to restore the place to its previous glory, pretending not to see the traces of the blast? Could they be completely erased or not? And if not, how could they become part of the history of the Susok Palace, including a new layer and connecting it to its contemporary image and reality without emphasizing the ruin? Reconstruction could imply the removal of the catastrophic event, of its uh, revision, balancing the past uh, with a contemporary message to be transmitted to future generation. The reconciliation of these two moments is extremely difficult, especially immediately after the destruction. After a catastrophic event, people desire to re-establish uh, the pre-existing conditions as soon as possible. And in dealing with reconstructions, uh, we are not only speaking about buildings, sites, walls and materials, what we normally call tangible values, but we are also speaking about people, memory, feelings and identity what we call intangible values that needs to be respected as well. So the seminar of today aims to discuss all these complex aspects of a recovery project 
from reconstructions to preservation, presenting several case studies in which uh, the memory of a catastrophic event has been differently considered. And to understand how the discipline of conservation restoration can help uh, reflect on the complex uh, historicity of works uh, and on the presentation of a matter that is marked uh, by the events. So we can start, I can give uh, the floor to our speakers of the first section, starting uh, with uh, Professor Ursula Schlederzauf. I'll have uh, to change uh, the screen. Okay, so uh, Professor Ursula Schlederzauf is Senior Professor for History and Theory of Conservation Restoration and for the transfer of innovative methodology, methodology in the practice of conservation restoration at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Hildesheim. She studied uh, art history and philosophy in Milan and Florence and conservation restoration at the Opificio delle Pietre Dure in Florence. For several years, uh, she was a conservator in the Bavarian State Department. And uh, now all the publications are mainly, her publication are mainly on ethics of conservation and also on development uh, of digital techniques in the investigation, documentation and visualization of fragmentary wall paintings. She has several projects going on, uh, supported by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Uh, and uh, since 1990, she is member of the General National Committee of ECOMOS. So, Ursula, I'll give you the floor. Thank you and hello. Uh, and please, uh, the next slide. After the disaster of World War II caused by German National Socialism, a complete reconstruction as it was, where it was, for many people seemed impossible. But even the device of Georg de Hio, we have to conserve, not to restore, in front of the horrific extent of ruins, was not able anymore to solve the problems. The nearly complete destruction of many old towns for architects offered the opportunity to rebuild a modern democratic nation, almost a symbol of liberation from Nazi dictatorship and terror. Art historians and conservators visiting the ruins of important monuments dolefully recognized that most of them were definitely lost. So in many cases, they argued that the only realistic option was a simplified rebuilding of urbanistic and architectonic structures with a replacement of spoils as far as possible. In practice, the individual cases presented very different challenges in relation to their state of preservation and their historical and actual values. So I present you three different case studies which required different solutions often developed step by step over a long time. The next. The first example of partially reconstructed built heritage is the Fugerei in Augsburg. The world's oldest social housing complex still in use was founded in 1516 by Jakob Fugger the Rich as a place where the needy Catholic citizens of Augsburg could be housed. It is supported by a charitable trust established in um, 1520, active until today. The little walled district from the 16th to the 19th century was damaged and enlarged several times, but its urban and architectural structure was maintained. 
narrow little streets are lined with terraced two-story houses with small apartments. The next. During World War II, the Fugerei was heavily damaged and partially destroyed. In 1945, the Fuga Foundation immediately started with the reconstruction of the housing complex. Together with the architect in charge, they decided to preserve the historical structure of the district. In the continuity of traditional craftsmanship with well-tried materials and techniques, the simple architectural design was rebuilt and the interiors were carefully modernized. It's not a fake, such a handicraft design is repeatable. Next. The Fugerei today preserves its historical and social values. Tourists can visit the Fugerei with an originally preserved apartment, the Bunker Museum, Museum of the History in World War II, and an exemplary presentation of a modernized apartment. Such apartments can be rent by needy citizens. Till this day, the annual rent exclusive additional costs amount to 88 cents. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, the Fugerei is a living monument for the citizens and for visitors. The historical urban setting, the historical function and use are preserved with a great social value for today. The reconstruction is declared as such. Mindful visitors cannot misunderstand it as a monument of the early 16th century. And last but not least, in the course of time, the reconstruction by itself became a historical document of the rebuilding after World War II. Next example. Now an example of reconstruction of an in fact not reproducible work, the Golden Hall in the town hall of Hamburg. It was a very representative interior with an ambitious political program. Famous artists influenced by Venetian Renaissance art in the first half of the 17th century created wall paintings with grotesque decoration and the depiction of emperors. A wooden carved and gilded ceiling framed oil paintings with allegorical scenes. Next. Here you can see other photo records of the interior carried out in 1943, one year before the bombing of Augsburg. Next. After the bombing, the town hall preserved mainly its exterior walls and the walls of the ground floor. The Golden Heart, the Golden Hall, the heart of the former imperial town of Augsburg, was almost Sorry. completely destroyed. There is somebody with a microphone. Yes, I, I heard some. <laughs> yes, uh, Tiziana, probably you can uh, you can switch all the microphone off. Uh. I'm checking, but everybody is on mute, actually. Okay. Everybody except for me, you and um, Ursula. Yes. So the, um, it must have been just a second. Now it's fine again. Yes, okay. okay. So we, we start again with the slide. After the bombing, uh, the town hall preserved mainly its, ex its exterior walls and the walls of the ground floor. The golden hall the heart of the former imperial town of Augsburg was almost completely destroyed. After a very simple rebuilding in the 50s, you see it on the right, um, a large part of Augsburg citizens agitated for a reconstruction of the historical interior based on the photos of 1943. The next. 
Thanks to the legacy of a rich citizen and with the support of the Bavarian State Department for Heritage Preservation, the interior decoration was reconstructed by craftspeople and traditional academic painters in 1980-85. Only for the oil paintings of the ceiling, they used a photographic reproduction. Here you see a general view of the hall and some details spruced up in new glamour. Next. So this reconstruction is a place of memory and a visualization of destroyed cultural heritage with historical and social goals and ethical problems. It is an evocation of the former imperial town of Augsburg with its important politic role and artistic splendor. But this unique artistic realization was closely connected to the performing artists and to the society of that time. Its reconstruction brought a serious loss of artistic and historical quality. However, most citizens perceive this hall as the central historical representation and meeting place of their town. It's not anymore memorized as a reconstruction. It's gaining by and by its own new originality. Next. The third example is Würzburg residence, the former seat of the Prince Bishops. The monumental palace was built by Balthasar Neumann in 1720-1744. The interior decoration concluded in 1770 with the participation of famous European artists. The residence was heavily damaged by bombing in March 1945. Thanks to American monument men, especially to John Skilton, the war-damaged palace received first new roofs to protect the interiors in 1946-47. On the bottom, a few of the residents after reconstruction. Um, now I'll show you um, four examples of interior rebuilding, restoration and reconstruction. They are marked with different colors in the plan of the main floor. Yes, it's okay, it's okay, you can continue. Um, the state of preservation of the residents after World War II is documented in the photo records of the ruins campaign realized in 1946. The floors were mostly destroyed and the rooms burned out, as you can see here in the green damask room in the Northern Imperial apartments. But it's amazing that many fragments of the interior decoration, especially the beautiful stuccos, were preserved and could be reintegrated by craftsmen. All movable furnishing of the residence had been removed in time and thus saved during the war. It was replaced after the rebuilding. Only the stucco ceiling is a complete reconstruction based on historical photos. The decision to reconstruct destroyed stucco decoration and painting on the ceilings in the imperial apartments was very hard for the experts. It contradicted the principles of Georg de Hio, the base for heritage preservation in Germany. Art historians were mostly convinced that the precious artistic creations were lost forever. But considering the many preserved parts of the interior decoration and the furnishing and the excellent photos of pre-war time, step by step they decided to visualize again the Baroque idea of a total work of art. Next. Let's have a look in the Southern Imperial Apartments. Here you see the Venetian room in photos of the early 20th century. The interior decoration was designed by the court painter Biss. You see wall paneling decorated with little oil paintings, tapestries, and an allegorical ceiling painting. All movable furnishing was saved during the war. Next. 
The only complete loss was a ceiling painting. The art historian and photographer Karl Lamp during World War II received the order to record all not movable parts of the residence interior with the new aqua color slide film. Here you see two photos with details of the painting created in seco technique on polished plaster. Next. With the rebuilding of the residence, the destroyed floors and ceilings of the imperial apartments were reconstructed from the 50s to, the, to 1970. On the left, you see a testing for the replacement of original doors and wall paneling. On the top, a few of the room after the conclusion of the works. The original furnishing was widely preserved it needed only some repair by specialized craftsmen. Next. But the ceiling painting designed by Biss was completely destroyed. Based on the photos, the academic painter and restorer, Karl Körner, reconstructed the painting. Intentionally, he opted for a paler color effect because he wanted to present his painting as a proposal of reconstruction. Here you can compare an original detail of the painting on the left with Körner's reconstruction on the right. It is a remembrance of the original, not a substitution. The Baroque interior is visualized in its integrity, but the mindful visitor is not fooled. The next example is the green lacquered room in the Northern Imperial Apartments. The decoration and furnishing were created by a well-proven team of artists of the court. The particular atmosphere of this room is created by its overall luminous green luster with glimmering surfaces changing with the incidence of light. Here two black and white photos of the early 20th century. Next, the color slides of Karl Lamp with many details of the room testimony the state of preservation of these luster surfaces in combination with oil paintings depicting putty and floral ornaments and gilded stucco framing before the bombing. Next, here you can see the room in photos of 1946 in extremely sad conditions. Nevertheless, it's amazing to see that many parts of the wall decoration are still preserved. But the architect in charge asserted that the very special glimmering luster was definitely destroyed by the heat of firebombs. In this difficult situation, the experts decided to change the methodology because traditional craftsmanship could not solve the problem. In 1970, they commissioned a chemical analysis by the renowned Dörner Institute. Next. Based on the analysis results, um, I, I, I heard somebody speaking. Yes, okay. Based on the analysis results, a team of specialized craftsmen made trail models for the reconstruction and reintegration of the green luster and the gilded stucco framing. On the top, you see the stratigraphy of the green luster, indeed with the use of some synthetic materials instead of the traditional copper resonate. Next. The oil paintings on the green luster in 1974 received a pictorial reintegration of Lacune by Wolfgang Lenz, an artist well known in Würzburg. At that time, it was still usual to involve artists for retouching. The goal was to recreate the unity of the image with reintegrations discernible at close range, at least by the experts. Next. The completely destroyed wooden inlaid floor was reconstructed with the help of photo records by craftsmen. 
On the right, you see the room after the conclusion of all works with the original furnishing reassembled. Uh, now, the last example, um, it is the most famous work of art in the Würzburg residence, the ceiling fresco by Giambattista Tiepolo in the staircase hall. The fantastic unsupported dome ward constructed by Balthasar Neumann resisted the bombing and saved the fresco. Here you see the state of preservation in the 70s, quite dusty and spotted. Next. During World War II, Karl Lamp received orders for extensive photographic records of the staircase hall and the ceiling fresco for fear of destruction and loss. Here, a partial view of the depiction of heaven with Apollo recorded with an aqua slide film. The state of preservation in 1944 was not the best, as you can see. Next. But in 1946, um, after several months without roofs, the preservation conditions changed dramatically for the worth. In the photos of the ruins campaign, you see large spots of humidity, microbial infestation and partial bubble formation of the pictorial layer. The fresco was saved thanks to the new roofs constructed at that time with the help of John Skilton, the famous American monument man. Next. In the late 40s, two conservators together with the Derner Institute did their very best to analyze the preservation problems and to restore the fresco. For a better aesthetical presentation of the painting, they tried to reduce the many gypsum cinder spots with a cautious retouching and cross hatching. In a handwritten document discovered only in the 90s, they declared that their retouching is an interim solution and reversible. Future generations may feel free to remove it. Next. Next. Okay. Uh, this message was important for the conservation performed in the early 2000s after extensive scientific investigation. Um, the first conservation concept was revised. Instead of preserving the whole restoration of the 40s as a historical document, Tiepolo's artistic goals became more meaningful. Now, I cannot explain the excellent conservation works uh, concluded in 2006, but comparing the two photos on the left before and on the right after the conservation, you see that with a careful cleaning and stabilizing of the pictorial layer, the idea of a look at heaven with uh, parcel colored clouds above uh, the allegory of Asia is re-established. Um, I see a question of Tiziana Caglianiello. No, uh, let's, let's go on. I have nearly finished uh, the next one. Today you can admire the illusionistic effect of Tiepolo's heaven overarching the staircase. Uh, the staircase hall, respecting the original artistic idea as well as the traces of aging. The last conservation continued the high level tradition of scientifically based restoration of Tiepolo's paintings in the Würzburg residence in the 20th century. Ay, 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 um, molto rumore. Mm. Ecco. We can conclude that the rebuilding and reconstruction of the residence interiors from the late 40s to the 70s show different approaches on the one hand to Tiepolo's great masterworks and on the other to the interior decoration of the imperial apartments. The conservation restoration of Tiepolo's paintings since the very beginning required a scientific investigation and renowned specialists. In contrast to the restoration and reconstruction of stucco and painted decoration and furnishing in the apartments. 
the latter were entrusted to the care of specialized craftsmen and artists, sometime with a little scientific support, but with the goal to re-establish their original appearance. It was a hierarchic differentiation between great masterworks and so-called applied arts, typical at that time. Today, many rooms of the apartments present themselves as a result of partial reconstruction. But this great effort after the destruction of World War II for us is a historical document by itself with a clearly provable monument value. This value does not diminish the significance of the residence. Instead, this rather enriches it. We have the duty to study and to preserve all historical layers, including the historical reconstruction, and to communicate the values to the public. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Ursula. Probably there are some questions. Yes. Have we enough time for the questions? Yes. Uh, if uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, yes, uh, Alexandra Skedstol. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello. Hello. Um, hello, I hope you can hear me. My name is Alexandra Skedstol from the BTU in Cottbus. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I enjoyed this very much. I have a question um, and um, it may be that I didn't look properly, but in one of the slides that you showed from the Würzburg residence with the ground plan, you have the picture before the war and then after the war. And if I look at the roof in the central area, it doesn't look now we're in the reconstructed moment as it did pre-war. And I was wondering, was it really Comera e Dovera or was it sort of looking for a unity of style? I'm just wondering. Uh, no, uh, the, the, the roofs um, in the 40s, immediately yeah. after the war, um, yeah. were um, only a provisorium. Uh, it was necessary to construct uh, these uh, uh, rooms uh, to protect the interiors. Uh, okay. It was uh, the great effort of John Skelton. Okay, good, super. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, I will leave uh, the floor to Sophie Chesum. Sophie Chesum has held uh, the post of curator of many significant uh, national trust houses, including Ham House, A Park, uh, and Petworth. In 2015, Sophie became senior curator for the Clandon Park project, leading on both the conservation and presentation of collections and also the significances of uh, the house and approaches uh, to conservation and its remaking. Recent research has focused on the Stuccatori working at Clandon, resulting in a publication and uh, the wider topic on the Onslow's family patronage, including horse racing uh, for social political advancement. So, Sothi, thank you very much for being with us today. I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacinta. Thank you, everybody. It's it's great to hear, be here. Um, it's such an interesting seminar. And thank you for Ursula to, for kicking us off in such an impressive way. Um, it begs so many questions. I have so many questions. And this is a very contrasting case study. So it would be very interesting to share it with you and to, to have a discussion afterwards. So uh, here we are. This is I'm going to talk about Clandon Park, which is a house in, in England. Um, and in England, Houses come and houses go. Um, and the, re the reasons for this destruction fall into only actually a few categories, um, lost by accident, usually by accidental fire, but occasionally by building failure, um, more likely by deliberate loss by demolition. 
Um, that could be through replacement. Um, it could be because the cost of upkeep relative to income becomes too high. It could be because lifestyle change or some external agency like requisitioning during war causes it. Um, there is an interesting difference in Wales and Ireland, where demolition relating to civil unrest has also been seen. But this really is kind of outside the scope of, of my talk today. So despite rising numbers of demolitions from the 1920s, the loss of country houses in England was not of widespread concern, strangely, because there were just so many of them. Until gradually people realised that houses weren't being replaced by new ones and that losses had reached their peak in the 1950s, this became a massive concern. Individual voices had been calling for the protection of houses and the National Trust became part of this when the UK government created the Country Houses Scheme in the late 1940s, which offered tax incentives, um, which gave uh, property owners um, significant, they could give property, property owners could give their houses of significance to the National Trust um, and that helped stem the tide. So architectural historian for the National Trust, James Lees Milne, who's almost also famous for his diaries, observed that the quicker country houses are rendered obsolete, the greater their popularity. He wrote this in 1975 for the Victoria and Albert Museum in London's exhibition catalogue, The Destruction of the Country House, and it's celebrating its 20, 25th anniversary next year. And how right he was. Over the subsequent 10 years, a tide of country house based adaptations were made for television. Brideshead Revisited made an early and resident start in 1981, followed by innumerable Jane Austen ad adaptations, all helping to cement the country house in British cultural identity. Um, sorry, I've just lost my place. There we go. Um, and it's also there's a huge sort of houses, as I'm sure you realise, there's just three publications I show here, and there are also a number of websites which cover it too, called things like Lost Houses, Lost Heritage, um, and Twitter is abuzz all the time with these things. With this context, I start my story at Clandon Park, which is in Surrey in England, about 25 miles southwest of London, and I focus on this one house to illustrate the fortune of many such houses, but with a slightly different outcome. The dwelling probably started as a modest manorial house served in 1086 by a church and we can surmise that this is the first house was gradually enlarged and improved and we know that by 1313 it had a private chapel. There is no written description of the house, no artistic record, not even an outline on a map. So surely with no memory there can be no sense of loss and this is one of my key points. Which brings me in contrast to this second house at Clandon, which is much better understood in part because of this incredible painting by Leandat Niff of 1708. It shows extraordinary detail. The house is large, it's high status, it's at the centre of a well-kept estate with a garden, agriculture and a park for hunting. And it's also the centre of an administrative, political and social power base, one that was last in the UK for more than 100 years. The house was bought by Sir Richard Onslow in 1641, adding to his family's accumulated land and property in the county of Surrey and further afield. We know that the second Clandon grew from a house with seven rooms and a chapel to become the grand house shown here. The only other source is a contemporary reference to the place by writer Daniel Defoe, who published his tour of the whole island of Great Britain in about 1724. And he referred to the ancient mansion of the Onslows. The seat is old and the estate is old too, for it has been many years in the family of the late Lord Onslow, improved and beautified both the house and the estate too very much. We know also that the gardens were laid out in the 1680s by Royal Gardeners London and Wise, which is what we can see here. That innovative sash windows were introduced around the same time, and that's all we know. The house was demolished by Thomas, second Baron Onslow, probably starting in about 1729. If the loss of the house at the time is regretted, this is completely unrecorded. But remembering this house was important to the Onslow family because they kept this painting, likely hanging it in their London house, but also signalling their longevity as a high status family, as emphasised by Defoe. So this is Clandon Park number three. 
designed by um, Italian-born architect Giacomo Leone, as he renamed himself James Leone for Thomas Onslow, as I've mentioned. And the high capital expenditure needed for a building of this size and quality was funded by her inheritance, uh, Elizabeth Onslow's inheritance, derived from the international slave trade. The house was completed in the 1740s, and the earliest description of it was by the antiquarian George Virtue after he visited the house in 1747, and I quote, the noble ascent in front of great stone steps and balustrade, entering into a most noble and elegant hall, 40 foot high, adorned with marble pillars. And this is the marble hall he's talking about, which was a 12 meter cube. And you can see here the exuberant work of attributed to Stuccatori, um, Giuseppe Artari and Giovanni Baguti. And George Virtue continues, carvings, bas relievos by Reisbrack, stuccos, paintings and gildings, most, most rich and costly. A fine dining room, three noble portraits of three speakers, another spacious noble room, columns, carvings, ornamented richly, called the Palladio Room. This house is very spacious, he goes on, has 12 rooms, each floor, marble tables, richly furnished, built of brick and some stone, and fine views and vistas from it. So this is the house. In the 1950s, it escaped likely demolition when it was given by the Onslow family to the National Trust, which happened in 1956. The house and its immediate garden setting were accepted by the National Trust primarily because of the Baroque ceilings and because it was a rare example of Leone's work and an example of the early Neo-Palladian style of architecture in England. In short order, the house went from being a private space where memory and experience were held by just a few people to a much more public space. And as a reminder, the National Trust is a charity founded in 1895 for the preservation of places of historic interest and natural beauty in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. More than 125 years on, the National Trust is the largest landowner in England, the largest conservation body in Europe, and it has over 5.7 million members. Visits in 2023 alone numbered more than 20 million to our pay per entry properties and with hundreds of millions more to open countryside. Our strapline Forever for Everyone encompasses our strategic aim to make heritage and nature available to as many people as possible, alongside our other aim, which focuses on climate action. As a large landowner, we can and are helping to reverse species decline on our land. So what does this mean for Clandon? It means that unlike most private houses, it's been visited by many thousands of people, recorded in innumerable photographs and written descriptions, both learned and personal, and this has resulted in huge communal significance. In addition, the house has aesthetic significance as a work of architecture, and this was appreciated by architectural and art historians, obviously. The house is graded one by the UK government, which means that it's protected um, by law. It also has historic significance because of over successive generations, three men of the Onslow family were speakers of the House of Commons, as Virtue mentioned, and also closely involved with the Royal Court and at the centre of politics. And then this happened on Wednesday, the 29th of April 2015. A manufacturing fault in an electrical distribution board in the house caused an uncontrollable fire. Although the house was open to, the, to visitors, Fortunately, no one was injured and there was no loss of life. Despite the ferocious speed and heat, firefighters were able to remove about 600 objects from a collection of about 3,000, exclusively from the Piano Nobile. I was there and the experience was unforgettable. The heat, the noise, the smell were overwhelming and of course the emotions I experienced that night, extreme sadness at the terrible loss of cultural heritage was the overriding one. Rooms and collection objects I had studied, admired, researched and disseminated, most of which were gone in a matter of moments. The suddenness, the indiscriminate nature of the fire all added to this sense of loss. The reaction of people who live locally was captured in the days afterwards. People said things like, I felt sick. I burst into tears. I haven't cried like that for years because I knew the building well and knew what was being lost. It is the greatest historic trust catastrophe that's happened in this area for at least 50 years. I felt terrified. The fire made the headlines in the UK across all media channels, the first such disaster for the National Trust in the digital age. So it attracted widespread attention. The house suddenly had a national and even international profile. 
In the immediate aftermath, the National Trust web pages for Clandon had nearly 200,000 visits from across the globe. And the three immediate questions were what caused the fire, how much will it cost and when will it be rebuilt? And of course, these questions uh, about who was to blame and could it have been prevented? But this really is out of scope for this talk. The morning after, the cellular structure of the walls, which measured about a metre thick, preserved Leone's external facades, including the roof level balustrade, all the chimney stacks and the plan form of the interiors. The majority of the interior finishes, however, were destroyed, apart from those in the northern side of the house. Only one ground floor room survived as an enclosed room, that of the Onslow family's dining room, the speaker's parlour, which I showed earlier, complete with its highly decorative plaster ceiling of the 1730s. And this shows the entrance facade intact. Only close observation shows the surreal sight of blue sky and white fluffy clouds where once there was fenestration and the interior of a room. I've talked about my feelings of loss as curator who had cared for the building and its collection, but what about past visitors, descendants of the Onslow family, volunteers, other, other, pe you know, other people more broadly and professionals in the art and architectural world? Did anyone apart from the National Trust care what had happened? And would anyone be interested in the difficult choices the National Trust would have to make as a custodian of this significant building? The short answer is yes. All kinds of people cared and shared their thoughts with us, their memories of the house and its interiors and collections, telling us about their likes and dislikes, how these connected to their lives and contributed to their personal history and the perceptions of their self and cultural identity, rather like the loss of a person. This extended also to people who had never visited Clandon, but for whom it represented as a country house, part of their British cultural identity. As I mentioned, Clandon hosted weddings and civil unions for many years, and these couples and their families understandably felt and continue to feel a particularly strong emotional connection to this place. The National Trust has listened to the viewpoints of many different communities, and at this point, there are two related questions the National Trust had to answer. What would be the function of the building? And therefore, how should we approach its repair? And it's really interesting to see Ursula talking about the Augsburg um, Fugerei, that the clear function was to provide domestic accommodation for people. But of course, this is a, a very interesting question for Clandon. So people made lots of really interesting contributions to what they thought Clandon could be in the future. Some people asking for a restoration, wanting it to be as it was before. Um, and then other people asking for different approaches. You know, um, so uh, you leave it as it is. Use salvage items to create something new. Create different ways of telling the stories of the house and its history. Clandon Park had been a home and all the other things I described, including a hospital and an archive depository. But from 1956 to 2015, it had been primarily a heritage attraction and a party venue. With the collection reduced, with the interior stripped out, what could its function be in the future? Almost all agreed that they didn't want Clandon to be demolished. The National Trust had come to this sad decision in 1967 at a house called Dunsland in Devonshire after a far more devastating fire. Clandon was significant and rare, and the structure, as conceived by Leone, survived intact. Demolition was ruled out by trustees who also directed that Clandon should remain accessible to visitors, ruling out other functions, such as a hotel or flats or offices. A conservation plan quickly established the different significances of the house, particularly those created after the fire. The huge spaces, the hierarchies revealed, and the construction of the building in particular. We carried out a detailed feasibility study with the chosen design team, headed by London architects Allies and Morrison, to explore the practicability, cost, and long term implications of different approaches for use. Based on Clandon's new significance, our approach or vision would deliver this. So the, the vision is divided into three, a physical approach, a cultural approach and a social approach. And the physical approach is that Clandon today provides a unique opportunity to see and understand how an 18th century country house was made in terms of design, physical construction, materials and craftsmanship. This involves, involves leaving the layers revealed by the fire, conserving and repairing whilst reintroducing windows, a roof, 
staircases and a lift and walkways to navigate the house, which will be all reversible. The National Trust will not replicate on a large scale what has been physically lost. This approach is not to memorialise the fire, I hasten to add, but to allow people to see the authentic 18th century fabric revealed by the fire. It also helps us to talk about the culture, the cultural background, the cultural making of country houses in England, drawing together all the different styles, ideas and materials, both in the fabric of the building and its collection, which came from all over the globe, including, for instance, class classical myths and imagery. And lastly, the social approach. So like other houses and estates, Clandon has been shaped by people of all classes and from all across the globe too. Some of these histories are well known, others are harder to uncover and less commonly told. So the National Trust wants to share the history, not just of those who commissioned the house, but those who made it and lived there and worked there too. These are really early visualizations. They do not in any way represent our completed designs. For those of you familiar with the language of architects in the UK, we are at Reba stage one and just entering into Reba stage two. We have the in principle support of statutory bodies in the UK, but there is still much detail to agree and to design. Um, just one thing would be, you know, the sort of materials palette and so forth. And this is, we're looking at cut through east to west in the building with the back wall of the marble hall and some of the rooms to the south are on the right hand side and to the left um, is the north side. I mentioned the principle of walkways, both reinstating the plan form and enfilade of the house, but also adding new and exciting views through the house. I show you on the left the saloon, where the gallery or corridor once was, looking east um, and reinstating the enfilade and the highly significant views in the Palladio room, on the right hand side, um, which is particularly important as it shows the views south to the grotto designed by um, Leone as well, which is in the garden. And the principle of a fully accessible roof terrace, recalling roof visits of the past and allowing people and particularly local people to see the house situated in its landscape um, and in its position within Surrey. And the marble hall, lastly but not leastly, is functioning as it did before the fire. An entrance hall, a huge space which overwhelms and impresses, and a place once again to host events. So this feels to the National Trust like a new kind of ruin. The house is enclosed, it's made safe, its remaining significance is preserved, and new significance is celebrated. And the house will be a vessel for displaying the surviving collection, for introducing new artistic commissions, and most of all, being the focus of activity and pride for the local community once again, ensuring the long-term survival of the house. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sophie. I see a question from uh, Fabio Pintardi. Yeah, yes, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, I was just wondering um, something related to the uh, renewable of abandoned buildings and the um, the the and the, I link this this fact on the the building I just saw. I'm wondering if if uh, in the UK the National Trust is also mm, programming or planning to. Um, make some action uh, on trying to uh, renew all the uh, abandoned reliefs uh, that uh, the deindustrialization uh, has, uh, has carried um, along the, the history because um, well there are many buildings uh, after in uh, all over Europe and I believe that so in uh, the UK as well which are abandoned uh, because of the changing of uh, the economy and like the this the swapping from the um, industrial age to the uh, new service age, let's say that, economically speaking. So I'm wondering if the National Trust is doing something about it and if there are some economical action which are in place to improve the uh, 
uh, aesthetic background of the of the cities and the urbanistic scene of uh, cities in the UK? No, it's a really interesting question. So as I understand it, it's a question about the National Trust's intervention more broadly, perhaps, in buildings across the country, um, particularly in urban areas where there's been um, a decline in um, wealth, maybe, so abandoned buildings that have lost their purpose. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, so I think traditionally the National Trust had not acquired buildings that were um, industrial buildings though that isn't that is not entirely true um in the 1980s we inquired um a mill one of the very first large cotton weaving mills cotton processing and weaving mills um outside manchester it's called quarry bank mill um in style um outside manchester um and for the first 40 years of our ownership we didn't really know what to do with it <laughs> to be perfectly honest um, and it was run by somebody else. And I think it's only as the National Trust has, as a group of historians and curators, has embraced um, a much, a far wider range of histories and stories that we have felt um, confident enough to take on different kinds of buildings. So I think until the 1970s, perhaps, we concentrated on domestic houses, which had some historic or aesthetic significance. It's only more recently that we've embraced, say, the back-to-backs, which are um, very humble dwellings in Birmingham, or as I said, somewhere like Quarry Bank Mill. But we also, I think, have a tin mine in in um, uh, in Cornwall, and we do. So we do have as a as a byproduct of the very large estates we've acquired, we do have industrial buildings, um, but they tend not to be urban, but that's not that's not entirely true. We, so, we own so much. Okay, but is there any other institution which, uh, which is uh, like managing that kind of uh, uh, buildings uh, in the UK or is there any like governmental programs that are, mm, yeah, like, trying to improve the aesthetic of urban cities for the abandonment of those kind of uh, uh, buildings or, it's, or not? yeah it, it it crosses across a number of a number of authorities um and it's very interesting that on the whole industrial heritage urban heritage has not been valued and there has been a huge amount of demolition and clearing both in in all our major um, commercial big cities um, in the northeast um, and across across the country. Um, the building protection relies on people being interested and noting the building's significance to protect it. If a building hasn't been protected by law under our listing system, then there is nothing to stop someone from demolishing it. And this has happened all over the all over the country some buildings which lend themselves well to conversion that has happened in wealthy areas so in manchester um in other areas you see um factories um sort of grand 18th century or 19th century factories being converted for domestic um, residences um but other buildings have been demolished um, and it's only if they have protection. So that might come under the local authority. It might come under the government um, and a body called um, English Heritage or Historic England that might do that too. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, I think uh, we have uh, another question from Ursula. Hi, Ursula. Yes, thank you for your very interesting speech. If I understood it well, uh, you have frozen the disaster uh, and uh, now you have an aesthetical approach to this freezing disaster. And my question is, uh, did you discuss about a simplified reconstruction of the interiors? Because um, some something like the stuccos and so on, it would be possible to reconstruct them. I think that in Germany, would be very difficult uh, solution like like yours and so it's uh, interesting for me to discuss it yeah it is fascinating isn't it so i think it's not completely frozen in that there are some things that we will have to change as we as we make the building usable again 
So we've had to make some changes already, taking away loose material um, and stabilizing other material. So I suppose that's the the first point. So yes, we've made a we've made a decision to to keep keep it as it is, but as I said, not not to memorialize the fire in any way, but to, I suppose, celebrate the making of the house in the first place. Um, so your other point about um, the kind of remaking, in our very first vision, we had thought that we would want to um, bring back into use rooms on the first floor particularly, and that we would give them new uses, perhaps as a gallery or something like that, probably a, a gallery for, for showing art. When we came to do that, it became clear as we talked through with the architects and we had, as you can imagine, long discussions about that, that if you're not making a replica, then the building, the architecture, the forms of the room, rooms, don't lend themselves very well to other interpretations. Um, by the time you've lined the walls out or you've plastered the walls or you've lined the window linings, um, suddenly you realise how much the rooms needed the architecture, the architectural language of the 18th century to, to, to make them um, into interesting spaces. And so we did explore this, but we, we really decided that it wasn't the right thing to do, that suddenly the rooms would look like you could be anywhere in the world rather than at Clandon. And we wanted people to know that they were always at Clandon. That was that was really important to us as, a, as an owner. Um, and so we really didn't, we did not explore putting things back in that way. OK, thank you. <laughs> and that's not to say that some people have asked us to do that particularly the marble hall, the ceiling of the marble hall, which was so special. It's been very hard. Mm, I think where yes. we where we had huge concern was making a replica at enormous um, effort and expense and um, yeah, effort. And I don't mean that because we're lazy, but just huge, you know, getting people trained to do this and then it ultimately be rather unsuccessful. What was so special about that ceiling was it was amazing and to try to replicate that we felt was was wrong it was doing a disservice to the craftspeople who made it in the 18th century that's how that's how we felt <laughs> do you show uh, historical photos and films uh, to the f uh, visitors or not we 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 haven't finished Ursula. We're still at very early stages, but we have we do have visitors. In we open the house. We've had seventy thousand visitors since we since we've opened, um, but just in a very limited way. Um, Jacinta and her team have visited, um, and have seen that. Um, but we we do have yeah we do have photographs and people have seen those. Yes, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes. Probably. Another question. Don't yes. We? There is a Sajita, a question for Sophie. I can do see you, it, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, do you think that the house presented in the way you describe will attract the same number of visitors as it did before? Uh, so that's a really good question and viability is very important. We have to be realistic that um, the house needs to, you know, it needs to have people come to see it. It's a heritage attraction, it's a place of significance, and that's really important. But it also needs to have a, a sort of a heart and a soul. And I think through changing exhibitions of collections, through artistic responses, through activity, that will bring that will bring visitors, we we hope and feel. Um, so yes, it's important to us that, that people come. That's our purpose as the National Trust. Um, and you ask about um, how the saved heritage items from the house will be presented. Um, this may come as a as a surprise, but we are planning to hang oil paintings on the on the walls, which are left as bare brick. Um, we're planning to have furniture which is whole in the rooms that are partial. Um, we find that juxtaposition interesting. We think it's it it uh, prompts interesting question about the making of those objects too. So yes, we're, we're planning to perhaps rotate things, but have um, exhibitions of objects. Thank you very much, Sophie. I think uh, that all the topic about presentation and uh, interpretation is, uh, is quite crucial uh, dealing with uh, damaged building. Now we are passing- Thank you so much. 
Now we are passing on to Michela Palazzo. Uh, sorry, uh, here I have uh, many things uh, on my screen. And I'm very sorry, but due to an expected event, uh, Michela Palazzo can't be with us today and asked me to present her text uh, with two case studies on fragmentary images that imposed uh, discussion between uh, reconstructing as it was where it was or the preservation of an image showing the traces of history. Michela Palazzo uh, was trained as a conservator restorer at the Istituto Centrale del Restauro in Rome. She has a master's degree in history of medieval and modern art uh, and a PhD in conservation of architectural heritage. She carried out restoration intervention in important sites, uh, teaching at the Istituto Centrale, and now she is uh, um, head of the Superintendenza in uh, Piemonte. She's author of several publications, and uh, she was the director of uh, the scientific committee for the restoration of uh, the mural paintings uh, of the Sala delle Asse by Leonardo da Vinci in the Sforzesco castle in Milan. And uh, she was uh, also part of the scientific uh, commission of uh, the um, Sala delle Cariatidi in the Royal Palace of Milan. Sorry, okay, yes. Restoration in Italy, as you may know, is strongly influenced by the theoretical critical approach and principles of Cesare Brandi, published about in the 1940s. And in Italy, his work was crucial to make conservation a multidisciplinary discipline founded on a scientific methodology. And uh, here the invitation to respect uh, the two uh, the two selves uh, of uh, of a work of art uh, in his historical and artistic unit. After World War II, Brandi has to address uh, reconstruction issues on movable and immovable heritage partly demolished or severely damaged, and the problems of how to complete large losses. The two case studies presented today are based on these theoretical and methodological principles. The first one is the Sala delle Cariatidi in the Royal Palace of Milan. And uh, this is the only room in the Royal Palace for which uh, a discussion about a reconstruction has been made. It was uh, partially destroyed in 1943 after bombing of the city and uh, by many years of neglect and also so-called uh, unintentional vandalism related to, to use as a space for exhibition made uh, the surfaces uh, full of scars. A discussion on how to approach the recovery of its decoration only started in the early 2000s, so many, many years after the devastating event. And probably if uh, the recovery of the hall had been decided immediately after the war, the decision taken would have been different. As you can see in the picture, soon after bombing, the decoration was, was much more intact uh, as it is now. Here the two pictures compare the situation of uh, before and after. Um, abandoned. Uh, a group of people sustained uh, the well-known motto as it was where it was uh, that is very successful in its simplicity and communicative power while other group of people were more influenced uh, by the memory of uh, 
Guernica shown in this space uh, during the famous Picasso exhibition, asking that the hall should be left uh, as an everlasting memory of the tragic bombing suffered uh, by Milan in World War II and more generally on the stupidity of war. In 2000, the condition of the surfaces was quite different from that immediately after the bombing. The bombing caused loss of entire part of the architecture of the roof, but all the abrasion of the surfaces, holes, uh, cuts, uh, and many demolition that you can see in the slides uh, has been caused uh, by inserting heating and uh, installations uh, for many years, uh, uh, ignoring the character of the place that was considered a simple container for exhibitions. So in 1999, it was decided to clean and consolidate the plaster and close uh, some of the losses uh, without developing, I mean, a critical concept uh, for the recovery of this image. So only in the early 2000, the Ministry of Culture decided to start a pilot project to give a sound methodological approach to what was done, promoting knowledge and understanding before taking action. The decoration of the Sala delle Cariatidi was carried out uh, between uh, 1775 and 1776 on the drawings of Giuseppe Piermarini. Here, the all before the war when it was used uh, for larger receptions and uh, balls. Here the bombing and the subsequent uh, fire and collapse of the roof, the exposure of the surfaces uh, to sun and rain for more than two years, and above all, the repetitive human damages over time have caused uh, the gradual disintegration of the materials uh, and the serious loss of large areas of the decoration. The singular ruined image uh, and its power have been also considered and at the end it was decided not to reconstruct the decoration but leave the surface as it is, making just small repairs and giving order to improve the readability, the reading of the surfaces. Today, this space is uh, one of the few existing memories of the effects of war that you can see in Milan and has uh, the significance of an effective warning against uh, the folly of war. And in this sense, uh, the literal the literal and etymological value of an authentic monument. While uh, the other spaces of uh, the Royal Palace were completely reconstructed, they all remains as a unicum in its full and painful authenticity. Reflecting in theoretical and methodological terms, the whole keeps uh, the double historical and aesthetic instance, activating the well-known dialectic described by Brandi. It was decided to preserve the whole in its ruined state without restoring it to its former glory and without pursuing an impossible restitution à l'identique. A choice that implies uh, the preservation, but also the best possible presentation of uh, these battered walls. In conclusion, the hall is uh, no longer the ancient one of Giuseppe Piermarini and Gaetano Callani, but it preserves its memory and many traces. 
today it needs to be understood historically and interpreted. In some way, it is a ruin, but it's located in a building that is very alive and at the center of the cultural life of Milan. The second case study is uh, the Sala delle Asse in the Sforza Castle. Here it's a different uh, case study and it's a from a fragmentary state. It's due to a complete different story representative of the historical evolution of restoration in Italy. The pictorial decoration of the room has not suffered damage related to war or exceptional natural events, but is uh, the result of human intervention. The work was commissioned to Leonardo da Vinci by the Duke of Milan, Ludovico il Moro, in, 19, in 1498. Leonardo painted a large pavilion of mulberry the mulberry trees is uh, the Moro in, in Italian, whose branches are held by ropes and golden knots. The work remained unfinished due to the arrival of the French troops, and so Ludovico il Moro and Leonardo had to escape in 1499. The artist probably completed only the vault and the lunettes and left uh, on the walls only the preparatory drawing. Understanding the image of the room that arrived to us was done researching archival documents and using advanced diagnostic methods. During the century, the Sotesco Castle was used uh, by the troops uh, and uh, the decorations on the wall were covered. The Sala delle Asse became a stable. Only in the late uh, 19th century, it was uh, decided uh, to bring back uh, the polychromy, but uh, the traces uh, of uh, the preparatory drawing on the walls uh, that are the only original evidence uh, of war drawings uh, by Leonardo da Vinci were left covered by lime wash uh, because they were considered artistically unimportant. A first uh, restoration intervention was done under the direction of Luca Beltrami, who was working to recover the entire castle between 1893 and 1902. Uh, the painted surfaces were uncovered, causing serious losses. For this reason, he decided to carry out a complete repainting of the decoration of the vaults and the lunette, giving the task to a famous painter of the time, Ernesto Rusca. The walls were covered with fabric and wooden paneling to recreate a sort of neo-Renaissance setting. Then, between 1955 and 1956, there was an intervention carried out by the restorer Otemi della Rotta, as part of the intervention of uh, the complete restoration of the castle after the damages uh, caused uh, by the bombing of the Second World War. And uh, the rooms of the castle were to become museum spaces. Uh, so criticizing also in, pos in opposition to the intervention of Luca Beltrami, it was uh, decided to take an intermediate decision. The tapestry were removed and were discovered the fragments of the monochrome, so a very important uh, black and white painting 
you can see here branches and trees, some images, and uh, the preparatory drawings. After careful research, it was realized uh, that the repainting of Ruska could not be removed uh, from the original surface. Uh, they were deeply covering and mixed together with the original paint. So Temi de la Rota decided to do only a quick uh, cleaning of the surface, uh, removing uh, the bright uh, appearance uh, of uh, Ruska. Here you can see an example of Ruska. <coughs> In order to give the surface <coughs> and um, sorry <coughs> and <coughs> sorry. an aged and worn appearance. So he cleaned, he washed the surface. But very interesting, he left some areas untouched as a testimony of Ruska intervention. At the end of the work, the room was covered with wooden panels designed by the well-known architectural office BBPR, and here in the north corner, northeast corner, you can see traces of the monochrome. And in 206, started a study again on the condition of the painting that needed urgent intervention. The work was divided into three different phases relevant uh, to understand uh, the final choices <coughs> made by scientific committee, which have conditioned the intervention methodologies. <coughs> Sorry again. In the vault uh, and in the lunette uh, that preserve uh, very few traces of the original polychromy, here you can see the traces of uh, Leonardo's painting, almost unexisting. The restoration <coughs> will be conservator and uh, will not remove uh, ray paintings. Otherwise, uh, the overall image of the decoration will be completely lost. The original plaster on the walls will be uncovered. So to see the preparatory drawings made by Leonardo. And uh, under the whitewash really emerge many preparatory drawings, but also some paint drippings that confirms uh, that the decoration of this room was never finished. Then uh, uh, the third point uh, is uh, the monochrome. Beltrami uh, left it under the tapestry. So Temi della Rotta did uh, the cleaning and a complete restoration. But because of the materials he used for cleaning, the monochrome arrived uh, to us uh, with severe conservation problems. A stabilization intervention was done without removing the pictorial retouches <coughs> by Ottemi de la Rocca. In this room, <coughs> in this room, there is the coexistence of different elements and a test area was developed showing Ernesto Rusca repainting traces of uh, Leonardo, pictorial, film, the interruption of Leonardo polychrome painting, and uh, the original plaster with the preparatory drawing. So at the end, uh, the restitution of the image of the walls, we will be oriented to respect the situation in which it remains uh, after 
Leonardo's work was interrupted without recreating a false completeness that it never had. But we can still see Leonardo's hand in the monochrome and in the preparatory drawing. We can appreciate Leonardo's idea in the painting of the vault, despite uh, it is not authentic. So the complexity of this situation will require interpretation for the public uh, <coughs> to explain what there is now and the reason for the choices that have been made. Thank you for your attention. I stop sharing screen. OK, and sorry for my cough. If uh, there are questions, uh, Michela Palazzo is uh, happy and willing to receive them. You can write a mail to me. I can send it to her or I can try to give uh, answers as I was discussing deeply with her these case studies. Yes, Ursula, please. Excuse me, Jacinta, maybe that you know it. Um, it's very impressive to see uh, the ruin of the Sala delle Cariatidi, but I wonder why they didn't uh, try to preserve uh, in time uh, the rests of this ruin without reconstructing, but uh, the rests were very uh, significant. No? And, they waited for uh, 50 years or more. Yes. I cannot understand it because it's a monument. I, I, I cannot understand it either. But sometimes you, you really, working in cultural heritage, sometimes you, you really cross uh, something in, incredible. And, and I mean, there is the superintendenza, the, the, the um, uh, historical heritage office in Milan, which is just uh, next door to the to the Palazzo Reale. And they allow to, to cut the walls uh, because I can even imagine that, uh, I mean, you can't protect it for a couple of, uh, of years, but it was really left abandoned and uh, everybody was entering the space, uh, putting installation, putting things for exhibition and then back again without uh, without any trouble. It's it's really, I, I, I can't answer you. And I think Michela Palazzo can't answer you either. Yeah. Ecco, non è una bella figura della soprintendenza. No, so the Sala delle, uh, la Sala delle Cariatidi got a roof, uh, um, I mean, it just take exposed a couple of, of years, uh, so quite in the short term, considering the, the after the war, it, it got the roof back again. But uh, really, the problem was uh, really mainly this abandoned, so it was secured mm -hmm. under a roof, but then uh, everybody came and it was just uh, a space, uh, I mean, that you can uh, cut uh, and uh, destroy and uh, and also probably the um, the decoration we know the um, how the the neoclassical decoration was done using a lot of gypsum so probably uh, the gypsum was uh, um, eroded with uh, rain and and so forth and if you don't do that i mean in 50 years it's just uh, um, it's just getting powdering and powdering and um, more powdering again. And if you don't do nothing, you you, you end up uh, in a, such a situation. So Ursula, you suggest it's a sign of stupidity, a war, but also not only a war. Yeah, if I could interject, Jacinta, yes. I think I'm I'm interested that at Clandon after the fire, I think there is a perception, and it relates to the. Hall of the Cariatids, that if something is damaged, then you don't have to care about it. So we have had to brief every single person working at the house that although something is damaged or looks broken, we still care for it in the same way. 
because we can see that people become very casual in the way they move in the building, the way they carry their tools, the way they put things down. Um, it's as if the brokenness is permitting a lack of care. So I can see how that happened. People are busy doing, putting their exhibition up in the sala. They're not thinking about what their, their impact is on it. I can see how that happens. And I think we had a, um, uh, a line, a principle, which was do no more harm. Yeah, so this is <laughs> We're not saints, but <laughs> we spelt it out. <laughs> Uh, this is also crucial for Palasursok uh, in Beirut uh, because sometimes you have the tendency to undervalue things uh, that are not uh, uh, looking well preserved, uh, not in a good shape. So you say, why do I care? But it's, uh, it's really the maximum of fragility they have. Uh, are there any questions? Then uh, I'm missing something. Okay, so we can make uh, a short break uh, until uh, 15.40. So nice to see you back again in 20 minutes. No, not in 20 minutes, in a quarter of an hour. Bye. Merci. Merci, bye.